So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Yasmin Zahar. I'm a climate and energy project manager with Climate Interactive. And today we're gonna to be talking about our world climate simulation. So thanks those who've joined and just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about and all of these logistics here. So first we're just gonna provide an overview of what the world climate simulation is, talk about what you need to facilitate it, what that looks like. And then we'll just go through a quick demo of our Sea roads model, which is the model that accompanies the world climate simulation. So for those of you who might be less familiar with our tools and models, we'll just run through a little overview of what that looks like, how you can use it. And finally, we'll just explore some tips and resources that we have available to you. We have a lot of different materials and resources for our facilitators so that you don't feel like you need to learn everything in this one hour webinar. We have a lot of materials for you. So just a quick overview of what the world climate simulation is. So it's a role-playing exercise that was developed by our team at Climate Interactive alongside the MIT Sloan School's Sustainability Initiative and the Climate Change Initiative at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. So the World Climate Simulation is a role-playing exercise of the UN climate change negotiations where participants get to explore the speed, the level of action, the type of action that nations and regions must take to address global climate change and reach those internationally agreed upon goals. And so participants take on the role of delegates, either representing a specific nation or a group of countries, a negotiating bloc, or in some cases, if you'd like to add this part of the simulation, they can also represent additional interest groups like climate activists and fossil fuel lobbyists to really mimic the different parties that exist at these negotiations. And so together they'll work to create a global agreement that allows them to reach those goals and successfully keeps warming below two degrees and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so the simulation really varies in length. Most we say run about two to three hours, but the great thing about the simulation as well as all of our tools is they're all under a Creative Commons license. They're all freely available on our website. So we really encourage you to edit them, to change them based on your audience's needs. So if you need to shorten the simulation, if you only have 45 minutes, which we've seen run a pretty successful simulation, you can think about ways to make the simulation really work for your audience. So it could be a condensed version. It could be a lengthened version if you're an educator and wanna run it over two or three class periods, which we've seen if you wanna combine it with a few other exercises, you really have a lot of creative liberty here to really do what you wish with our materials and you can kind of use them as a guide and as guidance, but you can really take them and make them your own. Oftentimes we see if facilitators are running this event, for example, for younger kids, they might uh, edit those materials a little bit to be just better informed and, and easier to read for those younger kids. That's an example. And you might include things that you might be teaching at a certain level. So there's a lot of different ways to really edit and uh, make this simulation your own. And if you ever have any questions about how to do that, you can of course feel free to reach out to us. And so the great thing about the world climate simulation, and I think what makes it really unique as mock UN or, or role-playing exercises go is that it pairs with our Sea road simulator. So for those of you who might be less familiar with our tools, Sea roads and we have a couple other simulators give you results in real time. And so we'll go into quite a bit more detail about our Sea road simulator, but it offers a chance for the participants to really see the impact that their negotiations and that their proposals have in real time to then be able to 
take that in and make changes to their proposals. So it's a really great complement to the role-playing exercise. And this game has been run all over the world. Uh, we just surpassed 100 countries. We're at 104 now, almost 2,000 simulations around the world. And it's a really great exercise that we've seen be really successful in so many different settings, uh, in educational settings, at the government level, in the private sector, to really teach people and have them experience the different levels of action needed and to really be able to see that and, and learn that in an interactive experience. And just a quick note, uh, I see we have a few of our En-ROADS ambassadors here and our En-ROADS users to just differentiate uh, some of the differences between this role-playing exercise and our other role-playing exercise, which is called the climate action simulation. So just highlighting a few differences here for those who might be a bit more familiar with the climate action simulation. So the World Climate Simulation focuses specifically on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And participants take on the roles of governments or negotiators, and it uses our sea roads model. So it's very country and regional based and focuses on overall greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Whereas the climate action simulation focuses on solutions and it's used at a global scale. And instead of participants playing a specific country or a specific group of countries, they'll play different stakeholders. Governments are one of those stakeholders, but you also have energy leaders, agricultural groups, climate activists as well. And so they work together to negotiate global climate solutions. So a great way that these can be used together is using sea roads and using the world climate simulation, you might take a look at what emissions reductions are necessary per country, per region to reach our global climate goals. And the climate action simulation allows you to really take a look at how we might accomplish those emissions reductions. So what happens if we were to implement a carbon price? What happens if we were to electrify vehicles around the world? So you get to look at specific solutions, whereas the World Climate Simulation looks at specific countries and specific regions and overall greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And so we'll look at that difference uh, a bit more, but those are kind of the main differences here. So for the World Climate Simulation, there's a few different things to take into consideration as you're setting up. So the first decision you'll have to make is what groups you'd like to include in your simulation. So we have a few different options for you. The first option is our three region negotiating parties. So we have developed nations, developing A nations, also known as our rapidly emerging economies, and developing B nations, which are all other nations. And so we've divided the countries of the world into three main groups. Whereas in our six region version, we've divided a few of, we've pulled out a few key countries and we've made them their own groups. So we have the US, we have China, we have India as their own groups. And then we have the European Union, we have all other developed countries, all other developing countries. And here you have just more groups, a big deciding factor for which region version to use is how many participants you have, we'd say, maybe between four to eight is an ideal number of participants per group, but we've seen this run with hundreds of students or participants, and you can have a really small group as well. So think about what the best way to make up these groups to add, if you'd like these additional groups, you might run the three region version and add fossil fuel lobbyists to the mix, or you might run the six region group with no additional interest groups. It's really up to you. So you can mix and match between either the six region and the three region, and then add whatever additional groups you'd like. And so the biggest deciding factor here is the number of people in your group. So you wanna make sure that there's enough groups for 
everyone to feel like they're a part of that group, like they can participate and their voice is heard. So you don't wanna have too many people per group. So think about how you might wanna set that up. Uh, sometimes we see climate activists and fossil fuel lobbyists really take a pretty powerful position in the simulation. So those are great roles to have. Sometimes you could have them be played by, if you're in an educational space, by a teaching assistant to have less focus on those groups but still have them involved so take a look learn a little bit more about the different groups the different regions the different versions and think about how you might want to set it up given all of these different options for you and so another thing to think about is also if you're running the simulation online or in person we've seen really big successes with both we've seen the flexibility that running a virtual simulation leads to. You can have participants from around the world joining. Uh, we've seen a lot of successes using breakout rooms. We have a lot of guidance documents on how to run a specifically virtual event. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And of course, we have seen in the past many years a lot of success with in-person events. And so think about what is going to work best for the current circumstance of your community and your network and how you might want to run the simulation. And so once you've kind of made those setup decisions, then you can shift into collecting the participant materials that your group will need. So there's really two main materials that your participants are going to need. The most important one is going to be these briefing statements. And so these are statements that we've written for every group. You don't need to write them yourselves. We have them for you. And they essentially allow everybody to kind of get on the same page about what they'll be discussing, what they'll be advocating for. Oftentimes people ask if you can run the simulation with people who might not have as much knowledge around climate negotiations. And these briefing statements really allow for everybody to really play this game and the simulation because it provides guidance, it provides the priorities of that country or region or interest group. And so it is a great way for people to feel like they can still participate in the simulation, even if they might not be too familiar with climate change negotiations. And so all groups, all participants get a briefing statement, even those additional groups like the climate activists and the fossil fuel lobbyists. And you can decide whether you'd like to assign your groups in advance and send out these briefing statements. Oftentimes that allows for a bit more uh, intention and planning during the game itself because people know what group they're playing, they know the role that they'll have to take on. Uh, but if that's not possible, you can, of course, provide those at the start of the simulation as well. And so the briefing statements are really the key material that your participants are going to need. The second material is just for the country and regional groups. And this is the proposal form. So this is what they'll be officially proposing to the UN. So they'll have to make a few decisions around uh, emissions reductions, around forestry, around climate finance. So just breaking down this proposal form a little bit. So they'll enter in their country or their region, and then they have three decisions to make around uh, emissions reductions. So the first will be in what year they'd like their emissions to peak. And if they'd like their emissions to reduce after that peak year, in what year that will be and at what annual reduction rate. And in those briefing statements, we offer a bit of guidance here because this is a really open-ended question and it can be really hard to know where to start. So the main purpose of that briefing statement is to provide guidance around what feasible actions they might propose here given their country or region's priorities. And then the second two here, are forestry decisions and land use decisions, uh, specifically on deforestation and afforestation efforts. So the first decision they'll have to make is how much action they'd like to take in preventing deforestation. So both of these are on scales of zero to 100% of maximum feasible action. So 
zero percent would be they're not changing anything they're continuing as usual as expected a hundred percent would mean they're taking the maximum feasible action that they can in their country or region so that's something that we've calculated given the available land uh given uh, a few different factors here where we consider 100% being uh, elimination of deforestation by the year 2050 in that country or region. And afforestation is calculated based on the available land for tree planting in that country or region. So here they have the option to really decide how much effort they'd like to make and how much effort they'd like to put into it. So it's less, uh, a technical quantifiable number. It's more just the percentage and level of action. And then the model will do the rest of the work to kind of quantify that. And then the final section here is climate finance. So this, as we go over the C-ROADS model, you'll notice it's less included in the model itself, but it's a really good way to use as leverage when you're negotiating. So uh, as we'll see, groups will negotiate with each other. So this is a great way to use climate finance and introduce the idea of climate finance and its importance in these negotiations. So the groups will have the option to contribute or request money from this global climate fund. And more often than not, you'll have the developed countries contributing and the developing countries requesting, and they can work together to strengthen their targets based on available funding, uh, push developed countries, for example, to provide uh, more into this global climate fund. So you have some options with, with how you discuss climate finance in the simulation. You can have it be a really important piece of it, or you can minimize its importance or its discussion within the simulation itself, it's really up to you. And we'll take a look a little bit about how that comes up uh, in the gameplay itself. So given this setup, given what version you're playing, if you'll be playing it online or in person, collecting all the materials that you'll need for each participant, for each group. Now you can move on to the actual gameplay itself and uh, what a typical agenda might look like. So to get you started, here is kind of a base agenda that you can pull from. So this one lasts about three hours. It's typically uh, the sections and the way that we tend to run our simulations and how we've seen most people run them, but you can, pull parts of this, you can, as we discussed, really shorten it or really lengthen it. You might have the debrief at the end be its own section. You might have the introduction be its own section so that people are really ready to engage during the simulation itself. So this is just a baseline agenda, which we'll talk uh, in a bit more detail here. Um, and of course you can change these time limits for each one given the time limit you have oftentimes facilitators will really take it as it goes within the simulation itself. Maybe in the first round of proposals, it's taking a lot longer than expected. So then you'll have to shorten the second round of proposals, for example. So you can be really flexible with it in the simulation itself as well. So let's break down some of these uh, parts of the gameplay. So the first thing you'll start with is an introduction. So here you'll still be yourself. You won't have entered the role-playing part of the exercise yet. So here you're just providing a bit of guidance and context about what the simulation is, the roles that the participants will play, what the aim of the simulation is, uh, what they'll be proposing, what they'll need to know. And you can also use this time to give a general introduction to key topics that you might want your participants to know. Sometimes it could be climate science. You might want to focus on climate impacts, uh, climate goals. Here you could talk about climate finance if it's something that you're uh, interested in and, and really want your participants to learn more about. So you can cover some introductory climate topics here as well, just to get everybody uh, kind of on the same page and understanding uh, a few more key concepts here. And this will also be a good time if you haven't created those groups in advance. 
to assign your participants to groups, allow them to review their briefing statements. We have a few different resources, especially for virtual events where we have spreadsheets you can use to write down the names of everybody in each group to keep a bit of track. If you're in person, you might have your table set up per group and you can just assign people uh, to sit where their group is. Oftentimes people prefer to run uh, random simulations. So you might ask them to just sit wherever they'd like. And in a breakout room setting virtually, you might just assign groups randomly. So that's the introduction, just kind of orienting everybody, making sure everybody knows what the goal of the simulation is, providing a bit of context and making sure they know what their groups are, making sure they have all their materials. And then you can get started into the actual role-playing part of this exercise. So here you might take a little break, you might leave the room or you might turn your camera off if it's an online event and really embody your role. So you're going to be playing a UN official as the facilitator. It might be the secretary general of the UN. It might be the executive secretary of the UNFCCC. And oftentimes we'll suggest that you put on a blazer or a scarf or change your appearance in some way to really indicate that the role play has started. Many times facilitators will also kind of change their demeanor. They might come in with a bit more of a serious attitude here and, and be quite strict to really indicate to your participants that the role play has started. Sometimes it can be a little funny to your participants, but they'll get into it and they'll know that they should be taking on their roles as well. So you'll provide your opening remarks as a UN official, and we've provided scripts for you to use. We have slides for you to use. So it's not something that you have to come up with on your own. Of course, you're welcome to, but we also have a lot of resources and guidance on what you can say during these opening remarks. So usually it involves welcoming your participants to this annual global climate summit, talking about the specific decisions that they'll need to make, the gravity of making each of these proposals really strong and coming together and working together. And once you've provided that context and given this, this speech here, then you'll break people out into their groups. So if you're running an online simulation, you'll do that in the virtual breakout rooms. If you're running an in-person simulation, you'll have everybody sit with their group members and start discussing what it is they'd like to propose. So those regional and country groups are going to have their proposal forms that they'll be working on filling out, given what's in their briefing statements. And as they're discussing this, as they're discussing their priorities, they'll also need to assign somebody to give a speech to the rest of the group about what it is they propose. So you'll have to make sure that each group is assigning a representative to present their proposals and that they're filling out the corresponding proposal sheet and not just discussing their priorities in a bit of a more vague way. So you wanna make sure that those proposal forms are filled out for those regional and country groups so that you can use those in the following parts of the simulation. So once you've used your time up for this first round of proposals, you'll bring everybody back as a group. And in this plenary, you'll allow people to present. So you'll have each group give a short presentation about what their proposals are, what their priorities are. If you're using those additional interest groups like your fossil fuel lobbyists, your climate activists, they'll still be able to give a presentation. They're not able to submit any official proposals, but they really can use this presentation to try to sway people, to try to incentivize people in some way. So they still have the opportunity to present during the plenary. And so as these groups are giving their presentations, you or maybe a co-facilitator or an assistant will be filling out this proposal summary. So this, for example, is the six region version where you'll notice we have a column for each part of the proposal form. So you'll note down in what year their emissions will peak, when they wanna start reducing their emissions and at what annual rate, 
uh, what their percentage of action is for deforestation uh, and afforestation efforts, and if they'd like to contribute or request money from the Global Climate Fund. And so once everybody has presented and you filled out this proposal summary, this is where you'll shift from the discussion to actually submitting and entering these proposals into the Sea Roads model. So if you're running a virtual simulation, you'll share your screen with the Sea Roads model up. If you're running an in-person simulation, ideally you would have some kind of projector or have people gather around a computer in order to view the simulation. And so let's just switch gears a little bit and let's take a look at the Sea Roads model and let's see what that looks like, how you input proposals, how you use the model for those of you who might be new to the model. Uh, so let's just back out of these slides a little bit. So there's two ways in which you can use Sea Roads. So we have a downloadable offline version, which looks like this. We've just released uh, a pretty new interface change uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, for those of you who are more familiar, you'll notice it's quite a cleaner look and we've got some updated features here. So this is the offline version. So you can download this and it runs offline. So if you're in a place where you might have limited internet connection, this is a great option for you. And you're also able to run C Roads just on a browser in a URL, it's croads.climateinteractive.org. And it'll pop up here. You'll notice it looks quite similar to the downloadable version. And so here you have your main interface of Sea Roads. Sea Roads is freely available on our website. I'll point you to where you can find it. And so you'll notice here, we're looking at the six region version and you'll notice on the bottom here, this table essentially mimics the proposal summary that we were just looking at. So we make it really easy for you to enter in your participants proposals, especially if you filled out this proposal summary because you can just enter them in exactly as they go. You'll notice, as we mentioned, there isn't climate finance included in this model. So you're just going to enter in the first five inputs here. And so to orient you a little bit at what we're looking at, we have, in addition to this table, so this table is interactive. This is where you'll be able to enter in those proposals. And we'll do that in just a second. We have two default graphs that we're looking at here. So on the left, we have greenhouse gas net emissions by region. So you'll notice that we split it up in the six regions that we use in the simulation. And here we have temperature change at a global level. And so you'll notice that some graphs use this language here. So they use baseline and current scenario. So what that means, what we're looking at here is our baseline. So this means we haven't yet made any changes to the model. And what we consider a baseline is kind of just a reasonable starting point in the world where there isn't dramatic climate action yet. And so we calculate that from the years 2000 to 2100. And so in our baseline scenario, we are reaching 3.6 degrees Celsius by 2100. And so ideally we wanna get this number down to well below two degrees or 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so once we start inputting some of our data here, so let's just go ahead and do that. So let's say we're looking at the other developing nations. We see that it's this dark blue line here. Let's say they decide to peak their emissions in the year 2040. So you'll just tab out of it or click out of the cell and the model will take it into account immediately. And so you'll notice at 2040, the other developing nations emissions peak and plateau through the rest of the century. We start to see here our current scenario, which is the scenario that we're building now, it's the live scenario, start to depart from the baseline. So the black baseline is always going to be the same. The current scenario will move based on what you're inputting into the model. And because it's a system dynamics model, everything is taken into account in real time. So 
you'll notice this temperature change drop. We have a lot of different graphs for you to take a look at. You can either click on a graph title and you have a lot of different options here. We offer graphs at the regional level. If you wanna look at overall global greenhouse gas net emissions, you can do that. Most of our global graphs are the ones that going, are going to have this baseline and current scenario comparison. And if you wanna go back to your main graphs, you just click on this home button. There's also a, a detailed tutorial video uh, that I'll be sending out so that you don't have to worry about memorizing or remembering all of the different features here. This is just to get you uh, a little bit more acquainted with the model itself. You can also access the tutorial video by clicking on this I here and clicking on this link here. And here's a bit of a written description of how to use C-ROADS. And so, we saw here, we entered in 2040, we saw the model change. Let's say they wanna start reducing their emissions 10 years later, 2050, let's say. You'll notice that nothing happens yet. And that's because if a group is going to enter in a reductions begin year, they also need to enter in a reduction rate so that the model knows at what rate they're planning to reduce starting in the year 2050. So let's say they wanna reduce 3% per year. Now you're gonna see the model take it into account. So you see this 10 year plateau here. And then at 2050, the other developing nations emissions start to reduce by 3% per year. And again, you see it reflected in this temperature change graph as well as this temperature change table right here. And so that's where you'll see a lot of changes happen. If you wanna look specifically at, let's say, now that we're moving on to the forestry issues, let's say we wanna look at net land use and forestry emissions by region, or we wanna look at global forestry emissions. We have that option here and we're actually uh, planning a, a quite a big land update uh, in the coming months to the modeling here. So we see that we have our other developing nations modeled here. Let's say they want to put in a 50% effort for deforestation. Then we see those emissions start to decrease. You also see that reflected in overall greenhouse gas net emissions. And they want to promote deforestation, let's say at a 50%. So that goes down even further. And so Again, if we wanna go back to our main graphs, you can just click on this home button and you'll do that with every region, every country. And oftentimes the groups won't reach that two degree or 1.5 degree goal in the first round. And that's perfectly okay and quite normal and common. And so you can either take the opportunity to explore the model more now, or at the end of the simulation. So I'll just walk you through a few additional features here. So if you'd like to focus in on more details, you can take note here, but all you really will need is to fill out this table. If you don't have a lot of time to prepare as a facilitator, if you might be overwhelmed by the technicalities of this model, you really just need to fill out this table based on what your participants have filled out. And so that's all you really need. If you wanna go into more detail, here are a few ways in which you can do that. So if you click on this three dots to the right of the graph title, you have a few viewing options. You can view it larger. You can view it in a new window if you really want to focus in on specific numbers. You can also copy the data to the clipboard if you really want to analyze some of these numbers. Uh, so you'll just click that and then you can paste it into a spreadsheet. You also have some different options here if you're interested in some of the assumptions that we make in our modeling. You can click on assumptions and you can actually change a lot of the underlying assumptions that we make because we want this model to be transparent and to work with what you think is the most accurate. So if you disagree with where we've marked our climate sensitivity and you think it should actually be 3.3 degrees, the model will take that into account. And you can always reset those assumptions here. 
The simulation menu is also where you'll be able to switch views, switch versions. So if you decide you're playing the three region version, you could just go to simulation, three region, and the model re-aggregates automatically. If you want to look at it at a global scale, you can also do that to say at a global scale, what is needed in terms of emissions reductions and land use. So those are your main options. You can also reset through the simulation menu, or you can also reset through this button, reset policies and assumptions. And that'll take you back to the baseline scenario. As I mentioned earlier, you have a lot of graphs to choose from. So you can either look at them through here. You have a lot of different graphs. I'd suggest familiarizing yourself with these graphs as you're preparing for the simulation so that you know what is available to you in case you get a question from a participant that might be able to be answered through a graph. So just familiarize yourself a bit with these graphs. We have population and GDP data, removals, land use, CO2 specific emissions, overall greenhouse gas emissions. We recently added quite a few impacts graphs. So we have our ones that we had earlier, which were CO2 concentration, greenhouse gas concentration, but we've also added things like decrease in crop yield. You can see that once you start entering in your inputs, you'll notice that this, this starts to change. So you can differentiate and compare baseline impacts to your current scenario. So what improvements are you seeing in the impacts based on the scenario that you're building? So these are great graphs to show your participants, especially if you know you haven't yet reached your goals. You might say, let's say we're looking at uh, sea level rise. This is a live map. It's a really great way to kind of help contextualize a little bit. So let's say you take a look at this. So this is the land at risk in Alexandria. You start making changes and you'll start to see land saved. You can also look at it just at a global scale. And so impacts are a really good way to talk about the importance of these proposals. So in your UN official role, let's say your group gets to 2.8 degrees, you can show some of those impact graphs and say, okay, this is what is happening and these are the impacts based on your current proposals. How can we improve that? How can we push even stronger proposals and targets in order to improve those impacts and lessen those impacts even more? So. Those are the two main things to take a look at. You have just a few viewing options. You can look at your outcomes in 2100. So this looks at a little bit of uh, some of your improved actions. You can, if you're in the United States and your participants prefer to see things in US units, mainly what that will do is change this temperature number to Fahrenheit and change some units, for example, here from meters to feet. Um, can change it back to metric units. You can also decide to show or hide graph tooltips. So that just means if you hover over, you can see the actual value if you're interested in that, or you can decide to not do that. It's up to you. Um, and then in help, this is where you can find a lot of resources that we have for you. So feel free to take a look at these and see if there's anything helpful. Uh, here we've got a couple great buttons. You can uh, undo or redo a change. Let's say you didn't mean to do something, you can just undo it and it'll flash and tell you what it's resetting. You can redo. You can also replay a change if you want to really make a point and say, okay, let's look at the difference from baseline to peaking emissions at 2040. You can also view it in full screen. And here's just a quick help overview. And again, this is all in a tutorial video that we will send. So don't worry about memorizing all of this. Uh, we've got a few different ways in which uh, we can share this information with you as well. The other really great feature though that we added uh, just a few weeks ago is the share your scenario feature. So you've created a scenario with your group, you wanna share it either to your 
to your participants or on social media, via email to somebody. So you can click on share your scenario. You can share it directly via social media or email. You can copy the scenario link. So let's say here, I copy it. I open a new tab. I paste. It's the same scenario that we created. So there's a lot of different features and options to explore in C Roads. If you're running a world climate simulation in a language other than English, the simulation is offered in several different languages. So if you're running, let's say uh, a simulation in Spanish, you can run C Roads in Spanish. Uh, if you don't see your language here, please feel free to reach out. A lot of these languages were translated just by volunteers. So if you have the capacity to help with translations and would like to see C Roads in your language, please feel free to reach out and we can make it happen. So that's uh, an overview of C Roads. Again, no need to, to memorize everything. There are many resources for you to review. Uh, so let's say you filled out all of these inputs, your group's at 2.8 degrees, you give an impassioned speech saying that, you know, they need to do more. Uh, these are what the impacts will look like at 2.8 degrees. How can we do more in order to reach two degrees or 1.5 degrees? And so you'll go back here and you'll enter the second round. So now that people have a bit more of an understanding of the impact of their proposals, they might reconvene, put stronger targets forward. Uh, this is especially uh, a great round to have groups negotiate with each other. So sending representatives to different groups. If you're in a breakout room, you can have them switch breakout rooms. If you're in person, you just have them move around the room. And so they work together, they negotiate, uh, they compromise. They talk about climate finance here, if you'd like to emphasize that point. And then they submit new proposals, ideally improved proposals, and you'll follow the same process. So you'll have plenary presentations from everybody. You'll enter it into C Roads again. If you're running out of time and you're still not at your goal, you might ask for just some additional proposals or additional suggestions from your group. Uh, if you're virtual, you might say, uh, does any country or region wanna strengthen their proposal even more? Type it into the chat, unmute yourself. So just work with your group to try to get to that goal. If you don't get to that goal, that's okay too. Um, and so once you've finished the rounds that you have time for following the same process, then you'll close officially this UN summit here. So again, we have some scripts for you to just talk a little bit about, you know, the great work, or if you didn't reach your goal, say, you know, how can we come back stronger next year? So we have a few different script options for you here and you'll officially close the summit. And so once you close the summit, that's when it's time for everybody to step out of their roles. So a lot of times people actually get really quite into their roles and it can get a little bit heated. It can get a little bit tense. And so allow people to kind of mentally reset before going uh, into the next section. So uh, if you are running an online event, have people turn off their cameras for a second. If you're in person, maybe take a few minutes break, have them stretch a little bit. Um, take off your blazer, your scarf, whatever you were wearing, and just have everybody come back as themselves, out of character. And this is where you'll have the debrief. So the debrief is really one of the most important parts of the simulation. So it's really where people get to process what they just experienced and really think about it and internalize it more, oftentimes, There'll be experiences like this and it'll end right when the role play ends and you don't actually have time to really think about it. So we really encourage you to leave quite a bit of time for the debrief to let people just sit with this and process it so that it really sticks with them a bit more. Um, so the first thing we like to ask in a debrief is to kind of just check in with people. How are they feeling? 
Are there any big surprises? We'll often see quite a big range of emotions from everyone. So if you have people feeling more hopeless, more down, ask anybody who's feeling hopeful or energized to share a little bit more, to try to inspire each other, but also make space for all feelings or emotions because a lot of it can be really heavy and a lot of it can sit quite heavy with people. So just check in, see where everybody's at, offer your own insights, offer some discussions about, you know, what's actually happening in the world, provide insights into maybe some things you weren't able to talk about as much in the simulation, uh, climate justice, different equity considerations, the urgency of action, talking about political feasibility, that's its own big discussion question, different goals. If you're in a specific country or community, what's actually happening in that place in terms of climate? What are some actions that people can take both at an individual level, at a global level, a political level? How can they get involved? Uh, providing some support to them as they're kind of internalizing this and processing it and talking about what they can do next. And so the debrief is the last part of the simulation. So that's kind of where it all closes. Uh, everybody tends to really enjoy the debrief part. And so once you feel like either your time is up or everybody shared what they needed to share and you've talked about uh, different things, then you can end the debrief and that will be the end of the simulation. So <laughs> that is the entire gameplay. Uh, I know it can be a lot. Uh, there are also a few other ways you can use sea roads and world climate. So that is the most extensive way. And we found that it's really helpful and really informative to people. Here are a few other options. If that feels a little bit overwhelming at the moment, uh, you can also always ask us for any questions or guidance or support as you're thinking through how you might facilitate an event. But if you're looking for other ways, to either engage with sea roads or the world climate simulation, there are a few different options for you. You can explore sea roads on its own. You can just take a look at the model, enter in different inputs, learn through the model itself. That's always an option. We also have what we call our sea roads homework exercise, which is essentially an assignment that we've created with just some guiding questions. So if you don't feel like you're able to facilitate an experience necessarily, or that you don't feel equipped enough with guiding people through the Sea Roads model, you can use this homework exercise to just have people still engage with it without having the burden fall on you as a, a facilitator. Uh, it's just something that they can answer. They're going to build their own scenario, answer questions about their scenario. So they're still definitely getting some learning insights from the model itself. The last thing you can do is also pair it with an En-ROADS experience, which we talked a little bit about at the beginning. So how you might pair emissions reductions and actual solutions and how they work together and what you're benefiting from learning one or the other and how they really complement each other. So for those of you who might be less familiar with our En-ROADS model, Let's just take a quick look. And thanks, uh, I see some questions coming into the q and I will uh, leave some time at the end. We are just about wrapping up uh, and I will make sure. So if you've got more questions as well, please feel free to enter those either into the chat or the Q&A and I'll be sure to take some time to answer them. So this is our En-ROADS model here. So you'll notice that it's quite a bit more technical. It's quite a bit more extensive. We have, 18 different sliders that are based in 18 different climate solutions. And this encompasses more energy dynamics, more market dynamics. And so you'll take a look at if we increase the price of coal, what happens. So using the sea roads model, you might say, okay, here is what's required at each country, at each region. And how might we actually accomplish that through electrifying transport, through increasing the energy efficiency of buildings and industry? 
uh, because this model is quite a bit more complex, the training for it is quite a bit more complex as well. So we offer an eight week training series to really understand the ins and outs of this model. Um, so if that seems like something that you're not able to make time for at this moment, I would just focus on the Sea Roads model and the world climate simulation. And so now to just take a look at what is available to you. So this is a lot of information all at once uh, in a short amount of time. So there's a lot of written materials and video materials that we have for you. So there's kind of two different types of resources. So first is resources about the Sea Road Simulator itself. So on this web page, again, we'll send this all out to you. So no need to write it all down. On this web page, there's more information about the history of Sea Roads, who created it, how it works. This is the link to download the offline version of Sea Roads if you want to run it in the application form. This is the tutorial video that I mentioned. I think it's about three to four minutes just going over those different features of the model so you can review that as many times as you'd like. This is a blog post that we just put out because as I mentioned just a few weeks ago, we made quite a few changes to the interface. So you can take a look at what we added and what are some of the features that are new this month. And this is our reference guide for the model. So this is about, I think a 400 page document. Uh, if you're really keen to look into the equations that we use in the model, the data we use in the model, the structures, you can find all of that in the reference guide. And so moving on to the actual world climate simulation materials and guidance. So this is the overarching world climate webpage. So again, giving you some context, providing different examples of how it's been used. The main page that you're gonna to wanna to take a look at is this world climate training plan. So this offers a bit of guidance as to the order in which to prepare for a simulation. So first on the list is attending this webinar. So you've done that, great job. <laughs> Next is looking at some of our written materials, looking at some pre-recorded videos, examples of a simulation that other people have run. This is another great page. So this is where we have all of the resources and materials for you. So that's where we have the slide decks that you might use. That's where we also have the participant materials like the briefing statements, the proposal forms. We have an extensive facilitator guide, which is essentially a more detailed and written version of this webinar uh, that provides a lot of guidance. That's also where you'll be able to find the homework exercise that we just talked about and some additional materials. And if you wanna learn about any upcoming webinars that we have, this is a page to just kind of check in on every once in a while. Sometimes we run public events. Sometimes we run particular webinars about a particular topic. So take a look at that every once in a while and see if there's an upcoming webinar that you might be interested in. And of course, for those of you who might not be familiar, we have a support platform where we are constantly answering your questions uh, the best we can, the fastest we can. Uh, there's a few different options on our support platform. You can connect with other facilitators. We have forums where you might reach out and say, you know, is there anybody who's, for example, new to Sea Roads and wants to practice with me? Or are there experienced facilitators of Sea Roads and World Climate who might be able to offer support. You can offer your own personal insights into uh, your experiences. We also have what's called a knowledge base, which is essentially an extensive list of frequently asked questions. And you can always create a new support ticket, which essentially sends us a private inquiry where we'll be able to uh, respond to any of your questions in detail. So if I don't get to your questions today, you can always reach out and uh, I'll make time to send a more detailed answer. And so with that, I'll leave this up. Thank you all so much. Uh, here is my email address. If you'd like to reach out, uh, ask any questions that you have, I'll leave this up while I 
go over some of the questions that you've asked so far. So thanks so much, everybody.